All right, so I, I like to do a little bit of <coughs> recap each time that we do this, in part because I want you to be able to see how these different perspectives are coming together and to differentiate them apart from each other. Um, you notice that I've got on this thing, you know, this listing of participants in the Republic, I've got a couple isms, a couple different moral theories listed. That's because at this point, you guys have been introduced to uh, three different moral theories. Introduced. We haven't gone into them in any great depth, but you've been introduced to them. Um, you've also been introduced to <coughs> sort of a traditional conception, which we don't actually have a name for, of, of uh, moral theory as well. So we're looking at book four, right, today. And that's focusing on the parts of the soul. That's actually going to give us the beginnings of Socrates' own perspective, Plato's moral theory, uh, which is a type of virtue ethics. So we're going to talk a lot about virtue today. Not a term that you're used to, to hearing, um, except perhaps in very restricted circumstances. Those of you who grew up um, Catholic or in, in certain um, Protestant denominations may have heard the term in part because of the catechism or the moral theory that, that uses those terms and they, they talk about virtues. Um, but you may still not have any idea what, what a virtue is. Right? And we're in a society that uses virtue language but doesn't use the word virtue. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But first, let's sort of recap here. So we started out in book one with this guy, Paul Marcus, right? Cephalus' son. Remember, he inherited the argument. Cephalus shuffled off the scene as soon as Socrates asked him a difficult question, what is justice? <coughs> and what did Paul Marcus say? He said, well, this guy, Simonides, uh, you know, famous poet, said justice is giving people what is their due. And there's really two kinds of people in life. There is friends and enemies. Um, what should you give friends? Do you, should we close these? Would that be better, I think? I see you kind of blinded. Right. You're okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, you got friends, right? What should you give your friends? Good things. Otherwise, they're not going to be your friends very long, right? He doesn't say that, but this makes sense. And uh, friends, you know, intend good to you, right? That's how you know they're friends. So friends are good people, and enemies are bad people. You've all met enemies, right? You've had enemies uh, at one point or another in elementary school, in middle school, in high school. It could have been a kid that you just didn't get along with on the playground, and you had to get in a scrap. It could have been somebody spreading rumors about you behind your back. It could have been somebody competing with you over the same things that you liked. It could have been competing for approval. It could have been competing for the, the boy or the girl who you were interested in. It could have been competing to be the best in some, some athletic thing. It could have been competing to be the best in some um, academic thing. Uh, what, do you do, what do you give to enemies? What do they deserve? Bad things. Right? Does this sound, you know, fairly commonsensical? Yeah. Every society has a version of that. Um, think about, you know, the, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? Um, well, you know, does that mean you have to be nice to everybody all the time? Because is there any way to twist that? When, when your mom or dad said that to you to try to get you to act nicer? Yeah. Well, you could be the one not doing nice before you get it back. So yeah, you can say, I don't have any problem with somebody, you know, when I act the fool, uh, knocking me down. I'd like somebody to do that, so I quit acting like a jerk. Therefore, I'm going to do that to this person. Um, some of these rules don't, don't, you know, quite, they don't achieve what they're, they're intended to. This is also <laughs> similar to the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of philosophy, isn't it? You've all heard that before. Somebody crosses you, what should you do? Somebody hurts you, hurt them back. That's what they deserve. So that's, if you're saying they deserve it, that's justice. Somebody kills your 
cousin <coughs> kill their cousin. This is the way a lot of ancient societies function, or societies that don't have what we call rule of law. Um, somebody talks about you behind your back. Maybe you don't have to do exactly that. Maybe you could do something else, like uh, find some incriminating photos of them and send them to their but under that, under this sort of view, that would be a perfectly just thing to do, wouldn't it? So this is one view of how to behave, how you ought to be thinking about things, how to be an ethical person. As a matter of fact, if this is the right way, then what about somebody who forgives people too easily? What, what are the, what's going on there? How many of you, because you've all been hurt by people, right? Plenty of times in your life? How many of you, when you were hurt wrongly, you didn't have it coming to you, um, had somebody else who told you that you should get over it, or that the other person really isn't that bad, that this is uncharacteristic of them, that um, you, you need to be the, the bigger man or bigger woman and forgive? Yeah, everybody? How did you feel? about that. How many of you forget? I, I, once in a while I did, but I, I'm, I'm more of a grudge holder, which is, which is a, a bad thing, by the way. How many of you felt kind of as if a second harm had been done to you by being told you should, you should, you should take it? Yeah, it depends, you're right. There's, there's a lot of circumstances. Um, this is a very deeply rooted conception of justice. There's a reason why every culture, every society has some version of this. Uh, we want to try to get beyond this because this by itself isn't going to work. Socrates pointed out some problems with that. Um, but it's understandable if somebody was there. It's understandable if that was the way somebody reasoned. Um, Thrasymachus comes on the scene, and Thrasymachus is much more radical, isn't he? He's saying things like justice is just the interest of the stronger, the, the weak are a bunch of sheep to be fleeced by the shepherd. <coughs> um, how does he treat Socrates? He does, he's not very nice in conversation, is he? He kind of represents his own philosophy. He's a jerk. He, he tries to impose his will on everybody else. He actually doesn't want to say anything until they give him some money. Uh, he has to get something from them, right? It's all about taking, 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 or imposing on other people. Um, that's a common frame too, isn't it? When you got hurt by somebody in the past, it might have been somebody like Thrasymachus. There are people out there who espouse this one. Everybody's just out there to use everybody else. So if that's really the case, what should you do? You should try to claw your way to the top, right? If it's just about having power, you'd be a dummy not to. Weak. You know, deserving of, of being, that word again, deserving. Deserving of being treated badly if you don't actually assert yourself. That's Thrasymachus' position. Uh, we can identify this with what we call egoism. Egoism is a moral theory. We haven't talked about this in great detail. Egoism is one of those moral theories out there that says, what's good? Doing what satisfies your desires. Your desires. Not his desires. Not my desires. Your desires. Now, of course, how do I see it? What's good is what satisfies my desires. And if it happens to go against your desires, too bad for you. You're screwed. You know? So if I'm the one in charge, and I'm an egoist, I'm going to set things up so that they work out really great for me. You know? Um, like, you know, it wouldn't be any problem for, if I was an egoist, to think that I should exploit you. <laughs> maybe, maybe what I do is I give you assignments that later on I'm going to use and cobble together into a book. I'm not going to give you any credit uh, or any money or anything like that, because, you know, it's there to be used. 
right? And you know, if you want to be on equal terms with me, you can find some way, we can work out some mutually agreeable arrangement whereby I use you and you use me. Doesn't that sound good? Like, you know, for instance... Be a little cutthroat after a while. <laughs> well, in, in some circumstances it will get cutthroat, especially if there's a lot of competition over the same goods. Because let's think about it in terms of that. I want... Um, let's not use money. I want to be heard. I want to get my point across. And let's say it's not a classroom where it's mostly me talking and you guys, you know, just responding and all that. Let's say we're just having a conversation. <clears throat> I want to talk and get my point across, but that cuts into your time. And he's, he's not even being heard from, and he's not getting in his time at all. And these two would like to talk just as much as we would. So, you know, uh, we might like team up just to, to shut him up. And then, and then once we've done that, now it's you and me, right? Um, it could get very cutthroat. It can get cutthroat over resources, it can get cutthroat over prestige, all the things that matter to us. Um, the perspective of egoism says that really there, there aren't any restrictions in and of themselves on what counts as you know, satisfying my interests, what would be good for me. Um, we might agree on those. I might, um, you know, not act a jerk. Well, for instance, right, I, I am dependent on you in a certain respect, right? How, how do you have power over me as students? Not much, but... I don't feel band together and didn't show up to any of your classes. Administration might look at that as maybe... Yeah, that would be... He's a lot of teacher, but other than that, I mean... You have other recourses, right? Yeah. Evaluation. <coughs> Say again? Evaluation. You, you fill out evaluations at the end of the semester, right? You all, I had a friend uh, back at my, my old school, and I don't know what he did to this class. Um, he was kind of an arrogant guy, a little bit, you know, a little bit full of himself. And, but he didn't deserve what happened to him. Uh, his students teamed up, and when it came to evaluation time, you know, the professor leaves the classroom, right? I don't know how it's done here, but that's the way it's been done every place that I, I... And the students got together and they said, let's screw this guy. And I think it was probably one of those cases where three or four of the students were very upset and then the rest of them said, yeah, okay. That, that's fine with me. I don't, I don't really like this guy particularly. And they all gave him very low evaluations. Well, those get used to decide whether you get promoted, whether you get tenure, um, all sorts of things along those lines. And of course, you know, when, when your evaluations come in, they're all very low. Your boss wants to know, what's going on? What did you do to these students that made them so angry? You know? um, so that, that's one way. You could also go on ratemyprofessor.com, right? Um, although now I think you have to have an account in order to, to use it. Um, I, I, I've gone and looked at that some of uh, my peers and I've looked at my, my own from my, my old school. Some of them are kind of funny. One, one person, one student actually wrote in the comments that I was lenient but strict. Yeah. Let's yeah, see <laughs> yeah. This is in a critical thinking class. Lenient but strict. What would be the problem with that? <laughs> yeah. If you're strict, you're not giving any room, really. But if you're lenient, you're supposed to be giving a little leash. Yeah. So I think they wanted to compliment, you know, two ways, but the compliments didn't quite go together. They say it'd be like saying smart yet stupid. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you could, you could, we could work out some sort of deal. Professors do this sort of thing where they say, I'm going to make it really easy on you, and you're going to give me good evaluations, and that can be done from an egoist perspective, right? When you, when you get into your career, you might find something that works out like that. But one of the things that goes along with this is you only consider your perspective or that of others who can, can affect your desires. So everybody else, forget about them. So we might get together and make a business deal that would benefit both me and you, but you know, screw all the consumers or the, the people who are financing it or things like along those lines. So that, that is a, a moral theory. Uh, it's not a moral theory in the sense that it's you know, very moral to act that way, but this is one 
way in which people make sense out of right and wrong. It's, it's a very low level, isn't it? What would be your incentive to, to be good to other people? You want to get something from them. That's it. Or you don't want them to hurt you. So, if you get really angry at somebody, don't kill them. Why? Not because killing is a bad thing, or because you'd be taking their their life away and then along with it all the other things that could happen just because you don't want to go to prison, right? Because going to prison would, would be a bad thing for you. That would be egoism. So that's, that's Thrasymachus' position. Glaucon is, is taking a position that gets us past egoism and towards something that we call contractarianism, which is a long, fancy word for saying we've got some sort of arrangement that we work out in society and that arrangement, um, we, 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 for the most part, we don't actually make that arrangement. We come to it and we're raised in it and it's already there. You know, for instance, uh, we were talking before class began about New York and gun laws. <clears throat> Apparently in New York, uh, it's illegal even to, ha to, to have a pistol in your hand unless you have a permit for it. Um, that's not the case in Indiana where I was living, or in North Carolina where I was living, but it is the case in New York. Why is that the case here? Because people pass that as a law. Why do you think they did that? We were talking a little bit about that at the beginning, yeah. So you can't hide a gun in your pocket or anywhere else and shoot anyone, whereas a shotgun, you can't hide it. Yeah, it's harder to, well, I mean, you can't. Well, I mean, you need a, like a trench coat or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, the idea was it was supposed to cut down on crime by removing one of the things that is typically involved in crimes by making that illegal. Right? Um, why should we follow that? If I, I don't have a, a gun, but um, I don't actually have any, anything against guns. Um, why shouldn't I go out and get a pistol and walk around with it, just you know, keep it in my pocket or you know side holster or something like that. Well, not just because they, they can send me to jail for it or actually prison. I'm assuming it's a felony. Yeah. A felony? Yeah. That's a kind of a serious thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, that would be egoism. Why else shouldn't I do that? Well, because I'd be breaking the law and I'd be disrupting public order and I'd be sort of upsetting the arrangement that we have. And I should care about that. Not because I really love justice for its own sake, but because the you know the penalty the, the what happens if, if I start breaking the social contract, if I start violating the norms, well you might start doing it too. If enough people start breaking the rules which protect us all, then the rules are gonna fall apart, aren't they? And that would, that would be bad, because then, you know, we, we all would actually like to be committing injustice. Remember, we talked about this in the Ring of Gaijus last class. If you had this ring that turned you invisible, how many of you would be, you know, resisting the opportunity to uh, take revenge on your enemies, to steal money, to have whatever you want? Um, that would be a very difficult thing to resist. Laukin is saying, look, you know, we really do have all these desires for other people's stuff um, to take advantage of people, like Thrasymachus is saying. But we get together and we say, okay, I'm not going to do that to you, and you're not going to do that to me. And we don't do it individually, we do it as a society. And that's what laws are. You know, think about, we, we used traffic um, and, and speed limits last class as an example. How many of you think that it's okay to drive um, five over the speed limit? Almost everybody. How many of you think that it's okay to drive ten over the speed limit in general? A few less. How many of you think it's okay to drive as fast as you want? Really? One. Well, now why, you know, what's the difference between driving ten over and driving, say, a hundred over? Well, you can't drive. <laughs> driving, driving 30 over. Um, 
How is that different for you? Well, the reason why I say it's that, you know, might as well drive as fast as you want because to me, I mean, if you're speeding, you're speeding. It doesn't matter if it's 5, 10 over, 20 over. Yeah. You, if you're speeding, I mean, right. you're speeding. So, I mean, you, have, you have the view that if, if you break the rule, you break the rule, and that's, and that's it. And that's, a, that's understandable. What about the rest of you? Why, do you? why did you say it was okay to drive 10 over, but not uh, 30? Yeah. Because the law is different. Like, if I go 30 and I get a you get reckless over, driving. I lose my license. Okay, so it's based on an egoist thing. Anybody else have any other reasons? Yeah. Could kill someone? Well, you could kill somebody you know, mm -hmm. driving the speed limit, right? But you're more likely. Yeah, right? Like, you're more likely to slow down. Yeah. yeah. That's good, yeah. There's a thing that, like, if you're driving 30 miles an hour, you hit somebody. Yeah. There's a 70% chance to live. And say you're driving 10 over that, so you're doing 40. Uh -huh. There's a 70% chance to die. You know? So the, the greater the impact, uh, I don't know if you're driving like 60 miles an hour, forget it, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so you're doing sort of prudential, what we call sort of calculating uh, things about odds of people getting hurt. Let's say we do this on a, a large scale. Bless you. Um, we're actually coming to some sort of agreement. Clearly, none of us respect the traffic laws as they are. We, we all feel they're too restrictive, right? But there is some sort of boundary for how, how much wiggle room there is. At least with this classroom, we feel, with the exception of one person, um, which, you know, and that's not a bad position to take. Well, I'm not saying you know, 50 miles an hour over. I'm saying yeah. you know, if you're going to break it, there's not really much of a difference between 5 and 10 and but 10 that's miles an hour over. But that's what's, right, but that's what's interesting. There is a difference felt by most of the people in the class. There is some sort of limit. Ten over, okay, that's fine. But if you're going more than that, now you're really acting recklessly. You're violating some, it's not actually the law of the land. It's more like something that we, we feel and we agree to. I mean, I, I asked you, I think, about this before. How many of you get irritated with people in the left lane who aren't breaking the speed limit? Right? That's kind of strange, isn't it? We're getting angry at people for following the law. Why? What is it about the left lane that makes us feel like this person is a jerk for sitting there driving 55? Well, because the left lane is supposed to be the passing lane. Yes. If the person in the right lane is going slow, you're supposed to pass them, and they go back into the right lane, so yeah. someone else wants to go faster than they can. So again, you know, there is there's sort of an agreement among us, right? This way is okay to act, this way isn't okay to act. The left lane is for this, right? Um, that's contractarianism. <coughs> the idea is we have these rules and these agreements, and, and if we follow them, we're doing the right thing, we're being just. If we break them, we're being unjust. And they could be based on some sort of egoist thing, ultimately, but, but contractarianism goes beyond egoism. Um, we're going to get to virtue ethics next with Socrates, and I want to talk a little bit about this term virtue ethics. So, how many of you heard this term virtue before, probably in a religious context? Just a few, okay. Um, would a vir how many have heard the term vice? Vice is the opposite of virtue. What, what do you associate with vices? Let's start with that. What, what's a vice? Like, I don't know, my interpretation is something that brings you good, but it doesn't have any, like, productive to your wellness. Okay. Kind of thing, like, uh, what kind of good does it usually bring you? Like, happiness. You know, it might bring you happiness, but okay. it doesn't really serve, like, a moral purpose. Okay. Like, let's say, you know, you like drinking. Drinking might bring you happiness. It may or may not be acceptable, but yeah. it doesn't, it certainly doesn't progress your well-being. Yeah. Well, although, you say, you know, if you drink a glass of wine per day, it's supposed to, you know, be good for your health. Right? So, so maybe some, some drinking in, in moderation. Moderation is a virtue. Um, we often think of, like, um, you know, drinking, smoking, gambling as a vice, right? <clears throat> what else? Um, frequenting prostitutes, that's why you have vice squads. Um, those are the things that we typically call vices. Vice, in, a, in its traditional sense, means any sort of 
bad um, disposition or habit, something that you don't just do once and then you know you never do again. It's something, it's a disposition, it's a part of your character. So if I'm greedy, for example, um, you've all heard of the seven deadly sins, right? You've all seen the movie Seven, and um, you can probably name them, right? Greed, uh, loss, sloth, you know, you go down, down, down the line, right? Those are vices. Um, originally, they were called the eight capital vices, and the list got changed along the way. I actually have a video where I discuss this, if, if you're interested in this sort of thing, because um, people are always fascinated. How did eight become seven, you know? How do they come up with these lists? Well, these are, these are dispositions that make people, according to virtue ethics, bad people. A greedy person, you can count on them to behave in greedy ways. Uh, what would be the opposite of being greedy in your book? Yeah. Generous. Generosity. Generosity is uh, a virtue that has to do with giving, what you're willing to give. Uh, now, it's interesting because you could, you could be stingy and not give anything, right? That's a vice. You can be generous and you give a certain amount. What if you give way too much? Is that, is that generosity? That becomes something bad again. Um, yeah? Are the vices an extreme form of something like wrath, extreme anger, anger, like um, in, sometimes um, in moderation? Yeah, it's a lot too lazy, like not lazy, but being too lazy. Yeah, uh, you're you're right. Vices are, are a form of extreme. We're going to get to this more when we when we read Aristotle, which is going to happen fairly soon. Um, I just want to introduce you to the general concept. So virtues are, are the opposite. They're good character traits. They're not just things that you do once in a while. Uh, by the way, one of the virtues that's opposed to greediness is justice. Greed is wanting to have more than your fair share, right? You want the whole cake, not just your piece of the cake. You want what you've got and what your neighbor has. That's more than your fair share. Um, Justice is wanting to give people their fair share, wanting to have your fair share. <coughs> so, virtues you have to do not just with how you behave, but also how you think and how you feel. So, if you do the right thing only because somebody compels you, you're not actually virtuous. Because as soon as they quit, they quit compelling you, what's going to happen? Think about kids. Think about kids and greed and, and, and generosity, right? <coughs> um, there's a cake. And there's 12 kids, and one of the kids gets to slice the cake. Um, if somebody isn't there to make sure that that kid actually gives everybody a piece of cake, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to get less cake, or no cake, right? Um, now, after a while, we develop these habits, and then you can leave the kid alone in the room, and then the kid you know, will come to desire wanting to give everybody their fair share. And some start out like that, right? Some kids are, seem to be naturally good that way, and others, others you, can, you can train them as much as you want, and they always seem to be kind of vicious, don't they? Um, but these virtues and vices, these are, these are part of our character. So we measure whether somebody is doing the right thing or not by how much what they're doing exhibits virtue or is part of promoting virtue. <laughs> And on the other hand, if, if what they're doing is promoting vice, like if, if I'm being a bad example to you, um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not modeling to you the way, say, somebody ought to approach these texts. If I come in and I'm real sloppy and I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm actually making you worse, aren't I? I'm giving you a bad model to follow and I'm leading you into vice. That would be bad. Now, before we actually look at Socrates' stuff, Let's think about some of these, these cases. These are fairly easy cases to decide with these, these things. Um, lying, you know. Well, an egoist would say, it really depends, doesn't it? Am I going to get hurt if I lie to people? If not, then it's okay for me to lie, especially if it gets me what I want. What about a contractarian, you know, who's concerned with keeping order in society 
and having a, you know, a social matrix in which we can depend on each other. How would they see life? They sometimes good, sometimes bad, because some people do need to lie. Well, they wouldn't say that because people need to lie, it would well, be okay. If there's, if there's sort of a general social expectation that you tell the truth, violating that social expectation would be, would be bad. Um, later on in the semester, we're going to try to imagine whether we could have a society in which it was okay to lie all the time. Um, but most societies say, no, you shouldn't lie. As a matter of fact, a lot of them demand you to tell the truth at certain times. Virtue ethics is going to say lying is bad too, uh, in general. Because, you know, think about it. Being a liar, being somebody who can't be relied on to tell the truth, that's a vicious disposition, isn't it? Do any of you want to live with a liar? You want to marry a liar? How about being a business partner? You want to be a business partner with a pathological liar? Only if you have them do sales, right? <laughs> and they don't lie to you. But if they're, but if they're a liar, that's the problem. If, if they're lying to customers, they're going to lie to you, too. So, you know, it's similar to, to the issue of if you uh, get into a relationship um, with somebody by stealing them away from their, their spouse, you know, and they're willing to cheat on their spouse, they're probably willing to cheat on you, you know. Uh, these things are rooted in our character. Um, stealing. Uh, again, the egoist kind of depends. Am I going to get punished? Am I going to get caught? Otherwise, hey, it's okay. Um, Thrasymachus would say, if you can get away with it, do it. Contractarianism. Can you have a society where, where people are violating the norm of stealing? How do we usually treat people who steal once social order breaks down? Well, when social order breaks down, then they normally cut off their hand or something like that. That's what they do in societies where they, they still have social order. They just have a very harsh social order. You kill looters, right? You get up on top of your store and you, and you shoot them as they're trying to get into your store. Um, one of the reasons why prisons are in some ways more humane, out in the, on the frontier, do you know how they dealt with, with theft? You hang people. You kill them. If somebody was, you know, breaking, if somebody was violating the social order and doing it, you know, uh, in a way where you can depend on them to do it next week, too. They're too dangerous to leave around. Um, I mean, it's not like they're killing somebody. But if they're killing somebody, you probably have to do that, too, right? Virtue ethics. Is it virtuous to be a thief? We have movies that make it seem like that, like Motion's 12, you know, and you know, uh, that sort of thing. But no, for the most part, we don't want to live next to a thief. Virtue ethics, you know, one way of thinking about whether something is a virtue or a vice, this may sound kind of silly, but would you like to live next to a person like that? Would you allow that person, somebody like that, to, to marry into your family if you had a choice? You know, um, who would you like to have in your family? You'd like to have people who don't steal, right? Maybe even when they find your wallet on the street, they don't just turn it into the lost and found. They, they look at it and they say, Oh, I know who this belongs to. I'm going to go take it to them. Right? Um, we can skip over the rest. What, what about when we get to these more difficult ones, like, say, bribes, right? Um, and they don't even have to be like bribing a judge. Let's say it's a matter of you're getting hired. All of you want to get a job, right? Competition is very tough, isn't it? Um, what if you take the person who's hired out to lunch? <coughs> you know, just to talk about the, the requirements of the job. You say, and, you know, they say, well, I don't know, I'm not quite comfortable with this, uh, but I'll go along with you anyway. You say, have anything you want on the menu. My truth. I just want to get you out here to talk about the, the position a bit. Now, you know that you're giving yourself a, a bit of an advantage, don't you? Not everybody's doing that. But it, you know, is it really wrong? I mean, you know, from an egoist perspective, yeah, do it. All those other people are dummies if they're not doing it, right? And that person obviously is getting something out of it if they're sitting there across from you. 
What about from a contractarian perspective? <coughs> you know, if, it's, if it's bribing judges and subverting the, the, you know, the courts and stuff like that, that can't be tolerated. But what about you know, what seems to be much more innocent you know, or gray area bribery? I don't know, does that cause social order to break down? If I take somebody out to lunch? I mean, something like, like stuff like that is popular because, like, if you're in sales, you know, That's everybody example, yeah. tries to say to a potential client, oh, you know, let's go out to dinner or, you know, I'll invite you to this big rooftop party in Manhattan or, you know, on a larger you're, scale. You're right. People do that stuff all the time. But and, it's and kind of... Where it gets bad is when it affects people not within that party. Yeah. Like, for instance, like, judge that uh, took bribe to send kids to juvenile detention centers. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think there's kind of like a social norm where we think it's acceptable. And it kind of somewhat refines within the two parties. And okay. Well, and, and, and it actually does, it plays out in politics, too, in our society. It doesn't have lobbying, <coughs> all sorts of things along those lines. That the... Local, state, and, and federal level. Um, a virtue ethicist, taking bribes doesn't really matter what it is. It's not that taking bribes in and of itself is automatically wrong. Another perspective we're going to look at later on in the semester is going to say that. What kind of character does a person have who is willing to prefer others for a lunch? Is that the kind of person that you look up to? No? Yeah. Well, it's all like recruiting and stuff. If you think they're a better candidate and you might hire them, there's... Well, that's that's going the other way around. Oh. That's that The recruiting really would be... Going, buying them lunch. Okay. Yeah, you know, that could be an interesting one to look at as well, especially thinking about, like, athletic recruiting, because sometimes, sometimes, you know, there are these cases every once in a while where some athlete has been given way more than they possibly should have been given by some coach, and then the coach gets disciplined, and then the question you know, <coughs> gets debated, doesn't it, on sports channels and Sports Illustrated. Well, is this really wrong? This is the way it goes. You know, somebody, say, somebody says it is wrong, and another person says it isn't wrong. You've got a moral disagreement there. Uh, I'm going to sketch out for you Socrates' position. And Socrates is drawing this parallel in this, this chapter between the the city and the human being. And he is sketching out an ideal city, right? You've got the rulers, the guardians, and you've got the, the let's just call them the soldiers, you call them the lesser guardians, and then you've got the tradespeople. And each one of these is important, aren't they? They all have their, their roles. They all have their, their jobs. Um, what makes them do their job well? What, what consists in their, their function? What makes them stay on track? What do they give to the city? It's not just doing something once in a while. It's, it's, a, it's a state of character. It's a habit. And the habit, the city character that the rulers have is wisdom. Or often we call this uh, uh, not just wisdom, but prudence. Being able to figure out what ought to be done. I mean, if a ruler is a good ruler, they shouldn't just be flying by the seat of their pants. They should actually have some plans ahead of time how we're going to deal with this problem how we're going to reconcile all these people who can't seem to get along with each other to each other, how we're going to promote justice within the city, right? How we're going to be fair, how we're going to uh, look ahead for, for likely issues that are going to come up. What about soldiers? What's the, the biggest thing that soldiers need besides weapons? Yeah? Courage. Courage, right, because if you have weapons, but you don't have courage, you're actually arming your enemy. As soon as you drop that weapon, they're going to pick it up. This is why, you know, um, it's not always a great idea to arm all the citizens against crime. You know, if you, if you like to carry a knife, but you don't have the guts to use it, and somebody attacks you, you've just given them a knife. Because they'll take it away from you and use it on you. Um, were you going to say something? Or? Okay. 
So your soldiers need courage. And is courage something that you just sort of tap it into? What do we do with our soldiers to try to promote courage? We're in a war. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. What do we do? Yeah. You kind of build morale so you said we can't be breaking down and build it back up. Exactly. They support the country. Yeah, boot camp for the for the Marines, uh, and for Navy people, I think, too, right? And then basic training for, for the Army, I don't know what the Air Force has. Um, and they're very similar. There's, you're right, there's a process of breaking people down, and you drill them, and then you build their morale back up, and you, you also put them into dangerous situations. Like, I remember in basic, one of the things that we had to do, um, which I didn't actually find all that, that, that daunting that some of the people did, was we had to crawl under machine gun fire through barbed wire and, and you know there were things blowing up you know around us. But I kind of like that sort of thing. Um, what I found scary was I had to rappel off of the tower. So I have a fear of heights. And I actually this is kind of an interesting digression. When I had somebody yelling at me and saying I'm going to throw you off this tower if you don't get off my tower, you know, um, I could do it. I was scared, but I could I could jump off and rappel. And I did it several times after that while I was in the military. I got out of the military, and a friend of mine said, hey, let's go repelling. I know there's not this great bridge that we can do it. And I was like, yeah, OK, I'll do that. And I jump off, and my hand would just seize up. When there wasn't anybody pushing me to do it, it turned out I didn't really have courage when it came to that. Because if I really had courage, I could have continued the repelling, right? We want soldiers to actually have that. Who else do we want to have that? He doesn't talk so much about this, but yeah. Firemen. Firemen, yeah. I mean, to go into a building that's actually on fire, totally encumbered in a whole bunch of stuff, that's, you know, that's irrational behavior. But it's done for some good, which makes it rational. And what allows you to do that? Courage. What else? Yeah. Policemen, yeah. Uh, let's cover the whole thing. Prison guards need too, don't they? Uh, especially with some of the prisons that might you know, work out. Um, and we'll leave it. We'll leave it here. Whether anybody else needs courage, I think that actually all of you need courage. Whether you be cops or uh, firemen or, or soldiers or anything like that, because we'll need it in other circumstances. But we'll talk later. What about tradespeople? Tradespeople are not the rulers. They're not you know gung ho. Soldiers out there, they're just people earning a living. Um, what, are the, what are the temptations that they're going to be subject to? Greed is one of them, right? Taking too much. Um, what they need is what's called temperance. Or moderation. You know, if you want to be a good electrician, you can't be a drunk. Can you? And you know, why, why are people drunks? Because they like to drink. Because it's enjoyable. Drinking is pleasant. And not always. I mean, the, the hangover the next day isn't. And, and when you first start doing it, you may not like the taste of some of the things that you're drinking. You know, like when you first taste your uh, dad's beer, you know, you open it up and bring it out to him and you taste it and you say, wow, how can anybody drink this stuff? It's horrible. But you get older and then you, you get a taste for it. Or when you have your first whiskey, that's awful. It's terrible stuff. But then you learn how to appreciate it, right? And once you do, now you got to watch out. Because drinking feels good. And it's fun. And if you do it too much, you're going to keep doing it too much, aren't you? You set up habits. There's an there's a added thing here. With the drink is, alcohol is actually addicting. But, the, you know, we can distinguish between psychological addiction, which is a matter of vice, and then, you know, physical addiction. Um, coffee is also addicting, you know. But coffee doesn't always make you act like a, like a jerk. Uh, you do too much of it. Or, or, you know, fall asleep at the wheel or things like that. Um, so we're less concerned with that. But, you know, if the tradespeople are, are drinking too much, or if the tradespeople are greedy, or if the tradespeople are, you know, um, what are other pleasures that can lead us astray? Uh, if they're lazy because they're you know, spending too much time in bed, they're not going to fulfill their task well, are they? 
So they need moderation. Everybody else does too. And then, according to, to Socrates, when you have all these classes having these things and they're all allowed to do their job, you have justice. Everybody is getting to do what they ought to do. So justice is a kind of harmony inside of the city. Right? And people who, who promote that would be just people. People who go against it would be unjust people. What about with the human being? Here's where it gets really interesting. Um, we can't see our souls. Right? There's, there's a very funny... Did all, did all of you see the new remake of the Planet of the Apes? I'm not talking about the one that just came up, but the one that came out about eight, nine years ago. Um, had uh, Tim Roth in it. Mark Wahlberg. Mark Wahlberg, yeah, he's, he's, the, he's the Charlton Heston character in it. Tim Roth is this gorilla. He's, a, he's an army general, and you know, of course he hates humans, and you know, uh, he's, sort of, he's supposed to be a typical bigot. There's a really great line in there. Mark Wahlberg is, is like one of the servants at that time, and they're having a debate, as people do at dinner parties, about, you know, well, you know, these servants of ours, do they have souls or not? You know, some people, you know, say, no, they, they don't. They're just dirty animals. Look at them, they don't even have hair. Like, you know, like apes. And, and um, Tim Roth's character grabs Mark Wahlberg, you probably remember this scene, right? And he pulls open his mouth and he, like, looks inside and he says, I don't see a soul in here, and like, pushes him away. And that's supposed to add the conversation. Um, we often imagine, you know, when we talk about the soul as something like, you know, you've all seen movies where somebody gets, gets hit, they die, they have a, you know, they're going to have an out-of-body experience, you see this kind of ghostly thing floating, sometimes it's in cartoons, sometimes it's, you know, like some sci-fi thing, uh, and the soul looks like the body, except it's just kind of see-through, yeah? And that's where the person really is, and their body's laying there just like meat now, right? Dead meat, as we say. Um, but what, what would be in there? What, what actually would be going on? That would be who the person really is, right? Because they're, they're not that slab of meat on, on the, uh, the table anymore. But what's in a soul? What makes you, you, other than, you know, wearing certain clothes, and having a certain appearance, which is going to change over time. You can change overnight. You know, you can dye your hair, you can gain weight, lose weight, bulk up, lose your muscles. You know, if, you, if you're a good actor, you can actually change the way you walk, the way you sound, the way you, you uh, project. What makes you you? Something, something different. We would often talk about it not necessarily as a soul, but as a personality, right? All of you have a personality? For better or for worse? You might like my personality, you might not like my personality, but I've got one, right? We all have one. Well, is it all just one big thing? Does every action that you're involved in, every, everything that you think about, everything that you desire, does it use the whole thing? Or maybe could there be parts of you? Have you ever had the experience of being undecided, being torn between two different things, not being able to decide what to do? Like maybe you felt competing loyalties to your family and to your friends? Or you were tempted to do something and you knew it was bad. Boy, it was tempting. Well, Socrates says, if, if that's the case, then there must be different parts, because the same thing can't be acting or feeling or doing the, the two different ways at the same time, right? Think about it this way. Can you be facing this way and facing that way at the same time? Maybe if you had, actually had the proverbial eyes in the back of your head, you could, but you can't. Um, so, what do we know that we do have in our soul? That's where, he, that's where he starts. Any of you desire anything? Everybody has a 
as a goal. So I think, I don't know, I think it goes along with, like, system of what you call values. Like, what we value yeah. in ourselves and in others that really makes up our character. What do you like about other people? Uh, I think that most people are good, caring, you know, okay. try to get along. Okay, so those are things that you desire in other people. Those are probably things you desire about yourself, too, right? Yeah. You want to be that way? Um, you probably want other people to know that you're that way? For the most part, yeah. Yeah. That's going to get us actually to the, to the sort of the second level uh, of, of the soul. But let's, let's work at the real base level. Why do I drink coffee? It helps me stay awake, but do I, do I need to be drinking coffee? I could be drinking, you know, four-hour energy or, you know, taking caffeine pills. Why do I drink coffee? It's real simple. I like it, exactly. I like the taste of it. It pleases me. I have desire for coffee. When I get up in the morning and uh, there's no coffee left, I'm ticked off. Who forgot to buy coffee? It's usually me, right? Uh, so I can get ticked off at myself. Um, what else do we have desires like that for? Get hungry, right? Um, what does is, what is our body tell us we, we should do? How many of you are going to go back to your, your dorm or something like that and take a nap? A few of you. Probably more than, than are copping to it. I, I would if I could myself, you know. But I don't have a dorm in here. So I'll go, go work. Um, we desire to do that sort of stuff. We desire to lay in the sun. Sunlight feels good on our skin. Uh, we desire not to be cold. That's why you wouldn't be sunbathing right now, right? We have all sorts of desires. And Socrates uses a, a word that's called appetite. Appetite for one kind of desire. Desire for things that please us or, or don't please us. You know, uh, Sometimes our desire is to get rid of something that, that's hurting us. Like when you're really hungry, you're not just looking forward to the taste of the food. You want that, that, you know, that hurt in your belly to stop. Right? Um, now, caring what other people think about us, that's at a different level. That's not just at the level of satisfying basic appetites and desires. Uh, he's got a word here that, in Greek that's very difficult to translate, and so we often say some, something like um, the spirited or the passionate part. This is the part of us that gets angry, too, by the way. Not angry like, you know, somebody forgot to, to buy coffee, um, but somebody forgot to buy coffee, and they should have, and I'm put out by it, and that shows that they don't care about me, that they think they're better than me. You know, when we get angry, we get angry not just because we don't have some, some need met, you know. Um, it can often have its origin in need. You didn't give me my food or um, my my place in the sun, or you're interrupting my sleep, or, you know, pick anything along those lines. But we really get angry because we care about the way people perceive us. And when somebody does something wrong to us, we think, aha, now I know how you really feel about me. I don't matter to you at all, do I? Or I'm lower than you. You think you're better than me. That's why we get angry. We, we feel slighted. We feel that the other person has, has lowered us. This is also the part of us that competes for, for honor. And, and to be honored by other people, to be respected by other people, often demands that you put your desires on hold, right? All of us have, uh, one of the desires we haven't talked about so far, sexual desire, right? Everybody wants to have sex. And they don't just want to have sex once. They want to have sex many, many times throughout their life, right? Can, can sexual desire get you in trouble? Anybody ever been in a relationship uh, and, and even though the relationship was bad because the sex was good? Well, I have, but you know, that was a long time ago. Um, I went to college. Um, why do we do that? Why do we, why do we do stupid things along those lines? Well, here's where we get to another part. You know, what would actually tell us that's a bad idea? Reason. 
you think about things. You say, wait a second. This isn't good for me. I'm not getting anything good out of this. Bless you. I remember actually, I, I, I broke up with somebody as a New Year's resolution. Um, she was very surprised. You know? and, and it was because, you know, it was a bad relationship. And I reasoned it out. That, you know, New Year's is, is the one time of the year where you start saying, what am I doing? You know, before you go out and start, you know, partying and all that. Um, and and uh, I thought, yeah, what am I doing with this? This is, this is not what I want at all. I don't see myself, you know, with this person a year from now. What the hell am I doing, you know? So I, I, I you know, reasoned it out. And reason can oppose appetite or desire. If you are trying to diet, your body wants to eat, Right? Reason can say to you, I want to lose X amount of pounds. I can only do that if I actually diet. This is what we call practical reasoning. Therefore, I must not follow this desire. So reason can do that. And reason is not all that, that uh, passionate. One second. But we also do that for this, this part of our soul that is concerned with honor, with self-respect, with how we feel about ourselves. The part of us that gets angry. Uh, we put things on hold for that. Um, you don't go out and satisfy every sexual desire that you've got, in part because you care about what people think about you. Right? You would like people to respect you. Because, you know, I mean, you're human beings like everybody else. Right? And these can oppose each other. Sometimes the appetites can so dominate a person that they bring everything else in. Uh, one extreme example is, is addiction. When somebody is, is addicted to drugs or, or addicted to alcohol, or there's, the, you know, I mean, I don't know if it's a, it's a real disorder, there's a lot of debate about this sexual addiction. But certainly food addictions, aren't there? Addictive behavior with respect to food. That's where the appetite takes over and makes all the other parts of the soul subservient to it. That's like in the city, if the tradespeople take over. You can also have the soldiers take over, can't you? You could have that part of your soul that is obsessed with, you know, honor and respect and stuff like that. That could dominate reason too, couldn't it? Reason tells you what the good thing to do is and what the bad thing to do is. Um, sometimes just doing what you feel like when you're angry <coughs> is, is, is anger always a really good guide to what you want to be doing? What does anger make you want to do? Something impulsive. Yeah, like what? Like going out and buying um, uh, a latte for your, your, your uh, partner? No. What kind of impulsive things do we do when we're angry? A violent act, or maybe yelling at somebody. Or... Yeah. And who do we yell at? Is anybody? Depends on how, what type of person. Are some people just yell at the person next to them? Other people yell at the person they're actually angry at. Yeah, that, that, that's true. Some people, their anger spills over into all sorts of other things. Clearly, going beyond reason, right? Um, it might actually be rational to yell at the person that you're angry at. Hey, knock that off. I don't like it. Um, is it necessarily the best thing to, like, you know, abuse them with all sorts of foul language? Maybe not. That would be up to reason to decide. What does uh, the spirited part or passion say about that? Yes! Or maybe hit them. You know? Or, you know, if you can't act right away, maybe tell people bad stuff about them. Maybe you have to sometimes put on like a real nice face, but you can get back at them later. That could be a good thing to do, but, you know, usually it's not, is it? Reason would tell you that. What does is, what is, uh, spirit tell you? Hell yeah, do it! It doesn't have... Um, uh, the capacity to regulate itself. And a society where the soldiers are in charge, does that have a capacity to, to keep certain things in check? Do soldiers make really good rulers? Not 
usually. They tend to look out just for their own interest, don't they? It's part of why we, we try to avoid voluntary dictatorships here in the United States. Um, what were you going to do? I was going to say, you were talking about uh, dieting and keeping. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I figured, but one could still eat, but they could just work out more. Or You're right. And you know what you're doing by, by saying that? You are reasoning. You're, you're finding alternate ways to make the same desired effect take place. Or one can eat more but less calories, like an egg has 90 calories, yep. but an egg white has 30 calories, so I could eat seven of them and only get to 270 calories. Again, using reason, part of your soul that does that, does, does your hunger distinguish between any of that sort of stuff? That, that part of your soul doesn't, it just says, eat, eat that, eat that, that looks good too, have some of that. Reason is what allows you to say, that's got so many calories, that's okay for me. That's got too many, that's not okay for me. And reason, if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your body and your soul are working right, then all three of these parts work together. That is what will make you into a just person. A person who is you know, integrated, a person who is in harmony. If your appetites dominate you, if you, you know, think about an addict. Are, are, there any, are there any heroin addicts or crackheads or meth heads who you would rely on to be just in their dealings with other people? No. But what do they do? What do meth heads do to, to feed their addiction? How do they usually get themselves in trouble? It's not by, by being on meth itself. Cop comes along, you're on meth, I'm taking you in. What do they do? Stealing or Yeah, that's the number one. They they, they steal. Sometimes they kill people, they try to mug them and it goes bad, you know. Um, of course meth will make you aggressive too. I guess one of the benefits of heroin over meth is that people on heroin just gonna lay around. People on meth gotta start looking for things to do, you know. Um, so if we had to choose what to addict people to, I guess we'd probably pick heroin. Uh, but it's not a good thing, is it? Because they're gonna, their appetites are going to dominate. Um, what if this part is, is in charge? That's the guy who gets in bar fights, whether he needs to or not. Or that's the, the um, more subtle warrior, the frenemy, the one who you know, puts on a face of, of being your friend so that they can get close to you and then takes you down because what they're really about is being on top. Um, you know, Thrasymachus is, is kind of a person along those lines, isn't he? And people who talk like Thrasymachus very often are dominated by this part of their soul. They don't just want to get, you know, what pleases them, whether it's, you know, food or sex or, or, you know, comfort or something like that. They want to be in charge. They want to dominate other people. They want to have power. They want to be looked up to. And they want it more than reason would, would say. And so they will, they will probably be unjust. They will do wrong things. And we see in Thrasymachus' case, it not only leads to being unjust, look at the way he talks to Socrates, you know. He's, he's, he's actually talking to his elder in these cases, and he's talking to him like, like he's a, like an idiot. Um, he's actually saying, this is the way we ought to be. Um, and one of the things that you, you could think about, and we'll, we'll think about this the rest of the semester, does that mean that we just put reason in charge and let that run the whole show? Yeah. And reason and prudence can also be seen as like sometimes as a vice.